Good morning, everyone. I hope you're uh, enjoying your time in Trieste. It's only been a couple of days, but I certainly have seen a lot of mathematics happening in the last couple of days. And I hope that you either have or will also some evening go into town and walk around Trieste, as I suggested, or at least at the weekend. And um, so today we'll continue on this um, basic introduction to ergodic theory, uh, which sits alongside the two courses that Corinna and Hannah are giving, which for the moment are still just giving a topological description. But later on, uh, tomorrow and the day after, and next week especially, all of these things will come together to uh, use ergodic theory to give some very sophisticated results about these uh, kind of examples that are being discussed. So um, I will pick up from, last, uh, from yesterday's lecture on the definition of invariant measure. And let me remind you what the uh, setting is. So we have um, x will be a metric space. And we have a map f, x to x, which in general will be continuous. But for a lot of the things I will say, only needs to be a measurable map. Actually, we have b is the Borel sets. And we will always just, whenever I mention a set, it will be a Borel set. And remember that the definition was that mu is f invariant. Well, I'm not sure if this was given as a definition or as a consequence of the definition of invariance. But anyway, if mu is f invariant, we have the property that mu of the pre-image of any set is equal to a, Okay, for all a. In B, or sometimes we consider even Lebesgue measurable sets, but it doesn't make much difference for us. So, why do we care about this property? So, for those of you who are already familiar with these results, you know that this property is magical, almost miraculous. <laughs> why is that? So, the purpose of today's lecture is to give a little bit of motivation for why we care about invariant measures. So there is a classical theorem, the first theorem. I will discuss two theorems and then give some examples. And these two theorems really are incredible as to what they conclude just on the basis that we have an invariant measure. So the first one is called Poincare recurrence. Theorem and goes back I believe, to the 1890s. So it's a very classical theorem, although I think that probably Poincare proved it in the particular case of volume-preserving systems, and it was later generalized to general measures. And the statement is very simple. Under these assumptions here, if, um, if we take a set of positive measure, Then for mu, almost every x in A, there exists an integer tau, which may depend on x, such that f tau of x belongs to A. So almost every point comes back to A. So the, I guess the remarkable thing is the, what seems like almost complete lack of assumptions for this theorem, right? So we have our, our space X. We have some set A. We have no information at all about the map. This is the, the crucial point of this result. The only information we have is that there's a relation given by this between the map and the measure. So this is a relation that connects the two things. And based on this, we have a set A. It has positive measure. We don't know anything about the structure of the map, but we know that almost every point 
comes back to the set A. So the proof is actually very simple. And it goes like this. So we want to show that almost every point comes back. So let's define the set of points that does not come back. So let's write A0 is equal to the set of x in A, such that Fn of x um, is not, does not come back for all n greater than 0. And then we just need to show that this set has measure 0. Right? So if this set has measure 0, then it means that almost all points come back. So we also let a n equal to the pre-images of a zero. Okay, the calculation initially is kind of abstract. And there's an observation which I will leave as the first exercise actually for today, for the, for the afternoon session. Exercise one is just to show that all of these sets are pairwise disjoint. It's a fairly simple calculation, but if n is different from m, this implies that a n intersection a m is m ten. Okay, and then that's really all you need because then it's very very simple because then we just take the uh, measure. So we take the union of all these a n's. So what's the measure of the union of these ANs? Well, we know on the one hand, we know that this is less than or equal the measure of the whole space, clearly, which is equal to 1. Do you agree? Obviously, it has to be less than 1. This is a probability measure. But these are disjoint, right? This is the key point. So they're disjoint. So what does that mean? This means that this is equal to the sum of the measures. This is just using the countable additivity property of the measures and the fact that they're disjoint. And so far we haven't used the invariance of the measure, but now we can use the invariance of the measure. So what is the measure of each a n? Sorry? Mu of a naught. Exactly, right? Because the definition of a n is f minus n of a naught, and the definition of invariance uh, obviously, so the, the definition here, because from this definition, you easily get that all the iterates are the same, right? So mu of f minus n of a is equal to mu of a for any sense. So this, so this is just equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity of the same, of just something that has some fixed measure. And why does this complete the proof? See that? This is clear, right? So this is an infinite sum. So if this had positive measure, this would blow up to infinity, which is a contradicts this. So this implies that this has zero measure. So you see, it's really a very, very simple proof, even though the, the uh, statement is remarkable and, in fact, has a really remarkable number of applications, even outside dynamics. I mean, there is a, it's remarkable how many times in some completely different context you end up with some kind of iterate, some kind of system, and then you say, by Poincare recurrence, you get your conclusion. So it's a, it's a theorem that has uh, applications even in, in other fields. OK, so still. However amazing this is, it's kind of not much compared to the next result, which goes back to Birkhoff in the 1930s. I think this is probably a paper of 1931 or so. And it's a kind of, in some sense, a more sophisticated version of this because 
uh, it says that not only if you take the set of positive measure, points come back to A, but they come back infinitely often, which in fact, there is a version of this, as just a slightly more sophisticated version of this, uh, this argument gives you that they come back infinitely often, but it also talks about the frequency of visits, not only infinitely often, but you want to know how frequently. So for example, do they spend, if you look at the orbit of some point, does it spend 10% of the time here or 20% of the time here? Okay, does that, does that probability exist? And so under this assumption that mu is an invariant measure, this theorem says the following, that for all phi in L1 of mu, so for all L1 functions for mu, and for mu almost every x. So mu almost every x means that the set of points does not mean, I, I guess you know or you were told, uh, in both cases it's mu almost every x. So it means that this does not hold for every point in A, but the set of points for which it does not hold has zero measure, right? Which is exactly what we've proved here. So we've not proved that this set is empty, but just that it has zero measure. So for mu almost every x, we have the following limit exists. So limit as n tends to infinity of 1 over n the sum phi composed with fi of x. Exists. I will make some comments to, to give you a better feeling of what this means and why it's interesting. So let me make a first remark. So what this is, is the, so phi, so we have our space, x, and we have our map on the space, so we have our dynamics on the space, so you have a point here, x0 that goes to x1, that goes to x2, you have the orbit of the point x under f, and then we have our L1 function, which is a function on the space to r. And what this is doing is evaluating this function at the, along the orbits, and taking the average. Okay, this is all it's doing. So, uh, this is an L1 function, so it can be a fairly crazy function. It's not a very nice function, but you look, at the, you look at the value of phi at this point, the value of phi at this point, the value of phi at all the different points of the orbit, and you take the average value, okay? There's absolutely no reason for which this converges. In general, it does not converge. The theorem says that if mu is an invariant measure, then it converges for mu almost every x. In general, this limit will depend very much on x. There is a very simple way to see that, to see this. If you take, for example, the identity map, so if, um, if x is 0, 1, for example, and f of x equals x, then what is f bar of x? Okay. Phi of x. Everyone see that? So if it's the identity, then every point is a fixed point. Right? If it's the identity, then every point just maps to itself, which means that this fi of x is always just x. So this is the sum of phi, the average of phi evaluated always in the same point, which is x. Right? So when you take 1 over n of the sum, you just get phi of x. So this is just phi of x. Okay? So even though this is an average, in some cases, so the lim notice that this has no measure in it, right? There's no, this is just the dynamics. It does not depend. This limit just depends on the dynamical system and on the uh, observable that you choose, on the 
test function, on the L1 function, there's no measure. The statement is just that for mu almost every point, the limit exists, okay? But this sum and the limit does not depend on the measure. It just depends on the point and the observable. So here I don't need to specify the measure. I'm just mentioning that if you take the identity map, then this limit clearly always exists. And in fact, this average is always the function. So this shows that in general, this limit will depend very much on the point, right? So in this case, at every point, you just have phi of x. Phi is just an L1 function. So it can be, the value can be completely different at every point, okay? So in the, in the uh, next two lectures, by uh, Lucia and Davide, they will introduce a uh, condition on the measure which allows us to actually um, know what this limit is and that tells us that this limit is essentially constant, is the same for every point, okay? That's the notion of ergodicity. But for the moment, for the existence of the limit, all you need is invariance and in general, the limit depends very much on the point. A, a very useful L1 function to get a better feeling of this result is to take the um, characteristic function of some set. Um, so let me actually, sorry, let me write it here. A bit more space. So suppose we take the, this as the characteristic function of some set A, or some A in X, right? So as you know, the characteristic function is just a function that has value one if X is in the set, and zero if X does not belong to this set. So this is clear an L1 function. So we can, we can calculate this sum, and what is it in this case? So in this case, if we have one over N, the sum of phi composed with fi of x is just one over n times the sum of the characteristic function because that was what we've chosen for phi in fi of x, i equals zero to n minus one. And what is this? What is this sum? This is, this is not the measure of A. This is just a finite sum. This is counting. What is this counting? So this is, zero, is, is one every time fi of x belongs to A. Okay, you see, this is the characteristic function evaluated in the point fi of x. So this characteristic function takes only values zero or one, depending on whether the point where you evaluate it is in the set or is not in the set. So for each i, you look at fi of x, and you say, does it belong to a? Yes, in that case, this is one. Does it not belong to a in that case? This is zero, okay? So this sum here is just a sum of terms that are either zero or one, depending on when this belongs, belongs to, um, to A, right? So this we can write as 1 over N, the cardinality of the set of indices between 0 and N minus 1, such that Fi of X belongs to A. Do you agree with this? Please tell me if you have doubts or, 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 or confused, okay? This sum is just counting how many times you fall in A, and this is also doing the same thing, right? I'm taking here fi of x, I'm checking each i for which it belongs to A, and I'm taking the cardinality of these i's, right? So this is a number between zero and one, obviously, because here I'm taking n indices. If fi of x always belongs to A, then this will be n, which we divide by n, which is one. If fi of x never belongs to A, then this is zero. So this is always a number between zero and one. And it is the proportion of times that you fall into A, right? So it is the frequency of visits to A. So the existence of the limit of this, which is given by this Birkhoff's theorem, Birkhoff's theorem said that this limit exists. 
which means that this limit exists, okay? Which means that the proportion of times that you fall in A is converging, right? So we take some set A, and we're counting how many times we fall in A. So we look at the first 1,000 iterations, and we say, okay, it falls in A 10% of the time. And then we take more. We take the first 1 million iterations, and maybe it's falling in a 20% of the time out of those 1 million, because maybe it just happened after a long time. It, it lands in A in some part of A where it tends to spend a long time. And then you wait longer, and maybe it's 15%, and then maybe the longer you wait, it's converging towards 15%. So then after some time, the longer you wait, the longer you wait, it just gets closer and closer to 15%, OK? Uh, very similar to when you just flip a coin and it's heads or tails. You don't know when it's going to be heads or tails, but if you flip it enough times, the average tends to converge to 50%. Okay, this is really the fundamental result. Somehow this is perhaps the most important <laughs> result in ergodic theory or dynamical systems and ergodic theory that is foundational to everything we do. Okay, the fact that this converges. Um, and to get to make that to emphasize that point, I'm going to say that again. This is for mu almost every point, and in many examples, it's not that difficult to find points where this does not converge. Okay, this, so this is going to be my second exercise. So let me make it as a remark first. So let's take one of the systems that we are familiar with we've been studying, which is f of x equals 2x mod 1. Right, you've been uh, you've been thinking about this map. Now, uh, did Hannah, did you say what that Lebesgue measure? No, you did not talk about invariant measures, I guess, yeah. No, okay, so, um, okay, it's not so important for the example, but it's fairly easy to show that Lebesgue measure is invariant for this map, okay? So Lebesgue measure, so uh, in, in uh, I think in, uh, Oh, you did, sorry, so, okay, so you already got this as an example from Irene. I was going to say that she, she mentioned that it's only necessary to check the invariance on intervals in this case. Anyway, so Irene said that this Lebesgue measure is invariant in this case, which means that that, theor that Birkhoff's theorem holds, okay? So this limit exists for any measurable set A. The frequency of visits exists, so let's take, um, our function phi to be the characteristic function of this interval 0, 1 half. Okay, so we look at this interval 0, 1 half. And now I take an arbitrary point, which can be inside or outside, it doesn't matter, and I take the orbits, and I look at the frequency of visits to 0, 1 half. So Birkhoff's theorem says that for almost every point, the frequency of visits converges to something. So you take the point, you look at how often it falls in 0, 1 half, and if you asymptotically, this will converge, okay? But the exercise is to find a point that for which it does not converge. Okay, so the exercise Find a point, find x in 0, 1, such that, um, such that this limit, such that 1 over n, the frequency of visits,
does not converge. There are lots of points like that. So the idea is that it will spend a certain proportion of time. For example, if you look at the first 100 iterates, it's easy to choose a point that spends all its time in here, for example. But then you can, by looking at the base two representation, right at the symbolic coding of the points, you can choose a point that then after that spends lots of time here, and then it can spend even more time here. And the frequency of time that it spends inside A and outside A oscillates so that it does not converge. Okay, so this is the motivation. I think this counts. These two theorems and the examples count in some sense as a good enough motivation for the definition of an invariant measure. As I said, it's really quite remarkable that both of them, even here, there seems to be almost no assumptions, right? There's, it's, you don't know anything about the dynamics. You're not assuming anything. You're just assuming a relationship between f and mu, which is given by the invariants. The question is, OK, does this theory, is this theory empty? In other words, you have, even though you have some very special cases, some very special examples of invariant measures, maybe in general they don't exist. OK, so we can prove whatever we want about invariant measures. Maybe they only exist for circle rotations, for 2x mod 1, and maybe there's a very few special cases, right? So the next question is really, do, uh, uh, in general, do we have invariant measures? So this is, I'm going to state a theorem in this direction. Fortunately, yes, in general, you have lots of invariant measures. Um, okay, so question, does every dynamical system have variant measure. Let me just, let's just look at a couple of examples first. Very simple example. If x is 0, 1, and f of x equals 1 half of x, I'm not sure if this is one of the examples that Irene did, maybe, in this case. Did you do this example? No? So this is my favorite, <laughs> most trivial, and most elementary dynamical system. So what? Um, so what is the system here, and what is the invariant measure? Right. So this is easy to see that if you take a point x, some initial condition x, you apply f of x, you just get half of x. Okay. So you get x one, and then you get half of x one is x two. Okay. So you see that all the points are just converging to zero, right? Zero is a fixed point. So f of zero equals zero. And this implies that the Dirac delta in zero, did you do Dirac deltas, Irene? I didn't say. No. OK. So Dirac delta, uh, let me de we'll define it in a second. So is f invariant. Maybe this should be also an exercise. So the Dirac delta in some point P of a set A is the measure that is fully concentrated on the point P. Okay, So this is a measure that the measure of the set A is 1 if P belongs to A and is 0 if P does not belong to A. So together with Lebesgue measure, this is probably the most important measure that, that, um, that occurs in dynamical systems. 
it's a very simple measure for the whole measure. So let me write this a little bit better. If P belongs to A and if P does not belong to A. So let me uh, give this as, a, as an, another exercise. This is a very nice exercise, right? So if you have a fixed point and you, dis you define the uh, Dirac delta on that fixed point, then this measure is invariant. So this is also a nice example because it kind of is useful to highlight also the limitations of the theorem, right? So since the measure is completely concentrated on this point, when we have a theorem that says something like, for mu almost every x, right? Then what does that mean in this case? Then the only conclusions we can draw are about that point itself, right? Because what mu almost every x means is that there may be a set where the conclusions do not hold, but this set has measure zero, okay? But if this is the measure, this measure is completely concentrated on the fixed point zero, and then the, you, the set of all other points has measure zero for this set, okay? So the conclusions of Poincare's uh, theorem and Birkhoff's theorem do not apply to any of these points if this is the measure we choose. We may have some systems that have many invariant measures, and then the mu almost every depends on the measure you choose. For example, you can general, for example, this map here, 2x mod 1, has also a fixed point at zero, but has also, it has also an invariant measure, which is the Dirac delta at zero, but it has also Lebesgue measures invariant. Like both of those measures. In fact, it has lots of other invariant measures on fixed points and some, it has lots and lots of measures, but it has at least those two measures. So the conclusions of this theorem, which is also important because I've emphasized how amazing it is, how miraculous it is, one of the biggest limitations is that it, the conclusions do depend on the measure you choose. So if you choose Lebesgue measure, then your conclusions is that for almost every point with respect to Lebesgue, you get some conclusion, right? If you choose the Dirac delta at zero, then your conclusion is the same, but in that case, mu almost every x when the Dirac delta is zero just tells you about the point zero. It does not tell you about any other point because all the, other, the set of all other points has measure zero. Okay, so it really uh, depends on which measure you choose uh, makes a difference here. So, um, yeah, so this is an opportunity to make those remarks and to, to include this measure here. Um, let me now ask you a question. I claim that as opposed to the 2x mod 1, in this case, this is the only invariant measure in the system. Can someone tell me why we're sure that this has to be the only invariant measure, heuristically, intuitively? Excuse me? We don't have the currents. Can you be a bit more precise about that? Sorry? Yes. Exactly, exactly. So by Poincare recurrence theorem, so suppose there was some other measure, okay? Some other measure which would give positive measure to some other set of points, right? Because this measure only gives measure to the point zero. If it's another measure, if it only gives measure to the point zero, then it's the same measure, right? So let's suppose we have another measure. So this means there must be some other set A that has positive measure. Okay? Then by the Poincare recurrence theorem, if there was another invariant measure, almost every point in here would have to come back to A. Okay? But this does not happen. If A is a small set, the image of A belongs to here and converges all the points in A, they converge to zero and they do not come back to A. 
Okay? So there can be no recurrence, exactly. So Poincare recurrence says that if you have an invariant measure, you have recurrence. And here, there is no recurrence, except at the fixed point, because it's a fixed point, it's recurrent. Okay? This is trivially, the Poincare recurrence applies here with respect to this measure, because this point here just comes back to itself all the time. It has positive measure, and it comes back to itself all the time. Okay, so... Um, so using this observation, we can modify this example. And what if we take the same map on the open interval, 0, 1? And we take the same map, f of x equals 1 half of x. Does this map have an invariant measure? Exactly, exactly. So exactly by the same argument it cannot have because the argument did not depend on the point 0 and 1. The only possibility would be the Dirac delta in 0, but 0 is not now in the set. I've removed it from the set, so we cannot have Dirac delta in 0. Okay, so every point is still converging to 0. We have, but 0 is not part of the set, so it's actually not converging, right? So this is, this is an open set, and not every sequence has to converge within the set, obviously, so you take x0, x1, x2, they would like to be converging to 0, but 0 is not there. Okay? So this is an example, uh, almost trivial example, of a dynamical system that does not have an invariant measure. And it has no recurrence. So in general, there is no guarantee that systems will have invariant measures. So, um, okay, so the theorem is the following. Theorem, this is the so called Krilov. Bogulyubov, which I never really know how to spell, and the Russian speakers here will forgive me. I don't know how to spell or how to pronounce, something like this. And this is a theorem from, also a very classical theorem from 1937, which follows exactly, yes. In this map, uh, I don't think that would give any. Okay, I'll have to do that calculation. I haven't done it. We're talking about probability. Sorry, everywhere here. Okay, uh, that, that brings me to a very good point. I am always talking about finite measures, probability measures everywhere in the Poincare recurrence theorem, because thank you for pointing that out, actually. So in the, if, if you take, for example, the real line, yes, and you just take a translation of the real line, then Lebesgue measure is invariant by that translation. Right? If you just take x plus 1 on the real line, then Lebesgue measure is invariant. But of course, also in that case, you do not have recurrence. That's an infinite measure on the real line, but the Poincare recurrence theorem does not apply, right? You just take a set and you just translate it and you lose it at infinity, so you do not have recurrence. So all these theorems, the Birkhoff theorem and the Poincare recurrence theorem, they hold for probability measures or every finite measure. In terms of your question here, I'm curious. I don't know. I haven't done that calculation. I will do that calculation and check 
Yes. But certainly, uh, here we're interested in always finite and probability measures. So the theorem is the following. Suppose X is a compact metric space. And F X to X is continuous. Okay. Then there exists uh, F invariant probability measure As you can see, the compactness assumption, obviously there are situations in which X is not compact and the conclusions still hold, but you cannot completely remove it as this example shows. In this case, the, the, is the lack of compactness which fails the existence of invariant measures. You can actually easily construct similar examples. If X is compact and F is not continuous, you can do a modification of this where x, the map is not continuous at zero, so that zero is not a fixed point and you get exactly the same conclusion. So there are obviously examples where these two do not hold and the conclusions do, but as a general result, you cannot just uh, um, really relax these properties. Okay, so I'm going to give a sketch of the proof here, which is also not that difficult. I'm not going to prove it completely, though, just an idea. Also because I only have 10 minutes. Okay, so um, part of the reason to actually give a sketch of the proof is to introduce a general concept which we will need here, which is the space of all invariant measures, so of all probability measures. So let M equals the space of all Borel, okay, I will implicitly I mean Borel, uh, probability measures on the space X. And on this space, we have a topology. So we have a way to decide when two measures are close, right? Or at least when a sequence of measures is converging to another measure. This is crucial. And there are several ways to define topologies on this. The most standard and uh, useful one for us is the so-called weak star topology. This is actually just a specific version of a very general topology, weak star topology in, in function spaces. The probability measures can be seen as dual of the space of continuous functions. So the weak star topology is just a, top, a standard topology on the dual of the space. And it is defined like this, that a sequence of measures mu n converges to mu if and only if the integral with respect to d mu n of a continuous function converges to the integral of d mu for all phi continuous. So I, I, I can, do not have time to go into more detail of this if, if you do not know what it means to integrate a function. Maybe in the first lecture there was some discussion about integrating functions with respect to measures. If this is unfamiliar to you, then just leave it. It's just this is a, a, a way to define what it means for the sequence of measures to converge. And there are two facts which I will use in the proof, after which the proof is actually very simple. And I will not prove these facts. They're just basic facts from measure theory or functional analysis. And the, it is the following. Uh, 
So one is that if X is compact, if X is compact, this implies that M is compact. M is weak star compact. weak star in this topology. And the second one is that if f is continuous, f x to x is continuous, okay? So there is a map. f induces a map, which I think Irene defined, which is called the push forward map, right? So we have a map F star is a map from M, M. And if you remember, this is defined in the following way, right? So F star, F star of mu. So you take a probability measure and you use F to define another probability measure defined in this way that the, the, the measure of the set A is equal to mu of F minus one of A. This is the way this map is defined. So given a measure mu, you use the dynamics to define another measure, F star mu. This is a probability measure. So this is really a map on the space of probability measures. And the statement is that if F is continuous, then F star is also continuous. Okay, these are not completely trivial facts, but they are general facts. And I'm going to assume these two, and then the proof of the krilov bogolyubov becomes fairly easy, easy just using, using these two properties. So, uh, proof not of these properties, but of the theorem. And what are we going to do? So, we're going to define a sequence of measures. So, I'm going to choose an arbitrary. So let mu zero be an arbitrary measure. This construction I'm going to give works for arbitrary measure, but it's also, because it's arbitrary, it's very useful to think of a specific measure. And so I would like you to think of the possibility that uh, mu zero is just equal to some Dirac measure defined on some point. some x. So the space is always non-empty, obviously. Why is it non-empty, always? Yeah? Exact, uh, what probability measure? Dirac measure. Yes? So this is always non-empty as long as uh, x is non-empty. <laughs> Because uh, if x has at least one point, you can define the Dirac delta measure on that point. That's a probability measure. Okay, so, so this space is always non-empty. Apart from the Dirac deltas on every point and convex combinations of these, it's not a priori clear that there's any other probability measures. But in general, as I said, in many cases, there are many probability measures. Sorry, I have to finish here. But let me, it will be very quick. Um, so now let, um, we define, given this, we're going to define a sequence of measures mu n to be equal to one over n, the sum of this push forward, f i star mu zero, i equals zero to n minus one. And I just want to point out what this means in this particular case. What does this mean in this particular case? So if we chosen like this, then notice that this is one over n, the sum i equals zero to n minus one of, um, can you see what this is when we apply to delta x by the definition? Okay, you should check. I will not give this as an exercise, but you should check that this is just the Dirac measure in fi of x, okay, in this case, if mu zero 
is equal to delta of x. So in this particular case, this would just be take the Dirac delta along the orbit of x and take the convex combination of this. Okay, that's all this is. So you're taking the orbit, you're taking the convex combination, but we don't need that. It's here, okay? And then by compactness, so this is a sequence, okay? By compactness or sequential compactness, to be a bit more precise, that we have in this case, this has some converging subsequence, right? By compactness, uh, there exists mu in M and a subsequence nk converging to infinity such that um, mu of nk converges to mu. And then I'm going to leave as an exercise, the third exercise, or now the fourth exercise actually, exercise four, to show that, to show that f star of the sequence converges to the same thing. Okay, this is a simple exercise. You just take mu n of k is this. This is a sequence, and now for each of these measures, I can take the S f star, the push forward of these measures, and I claim that this sequence converges to the same measure as mu n k, right? So mu n k converges to mu, f star of mu and k converges to mu, and this gives it, right? Why does it give the result? Now we use the continuity of f star, okay? So by continuity, then by continuity of f star, so one of the definition of continuity is that the limit, the image of the limit is the is the uh, limit of the images or something like that, right? So f star of mu n k must converge, f star of mu n k converges to f star of mu, okay? And therefore, since this converges to mu and this converges also to f star of mu, so this together implies that mu is equal to f star of mu which implies that mu is an invariant measure. Sorry, maybe you cannot see it down here. Okay, which is what we wanted to prove. So the, the result is that we've used the compactness of, of M, so we've used these two properties here, right? So uh, we just take an arbitrary measure, we take the average of these measures by the push forward, that's why we're using the dynamics. Right, to construct this invariant measure because in the end the measure you get has to be connected to the dynamics. Right? So we use the dynamics and, um, and uh, we take the average and then we use the compactness so that there exists a limit point and the continuity of f star to show that this limit point is invariant under f star and therefore is an invariant measure. Uh, to wrap up the last 30 seconds, let me say that, again, this theorem is remarkable, but it has its limitations in the sense that it just shows that there exists an invariant measure. It doesn't give us any information about the invariant measure. And as I have emphasized with the example of 2x mod 1, in general, you have many systems that have infinitely many invariant measures. And the question is, which one are you interested in? Which one do you choose? In the case of 2x mod 1, if you're given the choice between Lebesgue measure and the Dirac delta in 0, for most purposes, you will choose Lebesgue measure because then when you say almost every point, it really refers to a set of full Lebesgue measure. Whereas if you take a, a singular measure like the Dirac delta, it's only very small points. But that depends. So one of the, in dynamical systems, in ergodic theory, you often have a choice of measures and you really want to choose which invariant measure you're interested in for whatever reason you want to, um, whatever thing you want to do. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you very much.